Pak Mokhtar Yadi, thank you very much for speaking with the Institute for Societal Leadership at the Singapore Management University. I'd like to bring you back to your early years. You grew up in a, in a very tumultuous, a difficult time in history. You lived through the Dutch um, rule of Indonesia, uh, the Japanese occupation, even the Chinese Civil War. During these times, were there any key events that you think maybe shaped your life or made you the man that you are today? Yeah, I think so. when I was a child soul and I have experienced so many different war and you know the war always is a damage, always is a death and definitely also making country in the very poor. So under such uh, circumstances, and then I have to try to survive. So maybe this is a, uh, also if one else a benefit to me to be very tough and to be per, uh, people, uh, the person I can facing any difficulty. So it built this kind of survival instinct in yes, you, no matter how yes. difficult the times are. Yeah. Can I focus <coughs> on um, the part where you lived during the Dutch, right? And you actually participated in some anti-Dutch activities mm -hmm. and because of that you were detained and mm -hmm. exiled to China. Could you tell us maybe um, why you did that? Why was it so important to you to fight the Dutch? Uh, when I was young, and then, fortunately, I have a one's uh, teacher, Mr. Lowe, my teacher is a very wise man. So when I was a child, I always uh, <clears throat> raising questions to him. Why so many of my classmates, they are very rich, but not me? What is the reason that in the society they have a rich and then they have the poor? And my teacher introduced uh, many the idea, many books talking about the capitalism and then imperialism. So this is the reason why when I was child. I was young, already in my, uh, my, my mind, that imperialism is not good for the nation. Do you have any other mentors when you were growing up that influenced you? Yes, my father. He is also my good mentor. <laughs> what did he teach you? Uh, yeah, he teach me how to uh, work hard, work smart, learn hard, and also how to say uh, saving money. That's it, sir. I learned from my father. But and also, you know, when I was uh, nine years old, my mother passed away. And my father at that time is uh, 40 years old. And since that, he never marries again. And he act as a father and also as a mother to look after me. So this is also uh, teaching me that a father, they have to fulfill his uh, father uh, obligation to let the children not suffer anything. But uh, when you were young, you told your father about your dream to be a banker, right? and he wasn't yes. too supportive of that. Yeah, so my father, he not believe that I be able to be the banker because we are not the rich man. <clears throat> we are living in the village and he don't think that I have the, such a capability to be the banker, something like this. But I convinced them him, <clears throat> the banking business is not selling money. 
but it's a selling trust. As long as I have the trust, and then I be able to be the banker. So that is uh, something you live by now, mm. that in everything you have to have yeah. the customer's trust. Yeah. Okay. And then maybe your question is, uh, you do have money, and then you are come from a village. How can the people in the capital uh, Jakarta city to trust of you? Well, yes, it's a huge <laughs> task to build a bank. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, my philosophy is uh, we have to uh, raise the cost to catch another horse. Yeah, this is Chinese uh, one uh, Chinese proverb that uh, if you want to catch a horse, and you cannot uh, buy your your your, your feet, <laughs> you have to raise another horse to catch it. That means if you want to have a uh, to to have a trust, you have to look for somebody to be your partner and who has the trust, who has a very wide connection in the, uh, in the society, and then it will be easy. And you started your banking career with uh, Bank Kamakmuran, correct? Yes, yes. And you actually convinced the owner, Andy Kappa, to make you a director even though you didn't have any banking knowledge. Yeah. How, how did you manage to persuade him? Uh, actually, I just told him that banking business actually is a selling trust, selling connection. So you don't have a connection. I have the connections. So I will invite some of my friends who is the say, very famous uh, businessman in Jakarta and they can attract uh, many of their friends to be our customer and then the bank will run well. You transformed so many banks. What, mm. what is your secret? Secret is selling the trust and then always think about, I uh, try to reduce the burden of my customer and let them make money. And then we will have a, say, a, a benefit from them. Okay, that sounds very easy, but I think when you actually carry it out, it's quite difficult, no? Yes, starting from nothing and then step by step and, and we will get it. <laughs> um, so how do you decide when it's time to move on to another bank? Uh, the main reason is because I think uh, my present uh, partner didn't have uh, any, say, capability, cap capacity to grow the bank uh, bigger and bigger. For instance, when I grow up the penny bank and then come to my, uh, my, my, my thought is I want to build up a second clearing house beside Bank Indonesia. The biggest uh, um, transaction at the time is a uh, cigarette. So how to get this uh, cigarette company, factory, all of them to be our customer? So I think uh, the only one person is uh, Lim Siu Long. Because he is the uh, sole importer of the Zengke. And every cigarette factory, they need this uh, Zengke. They have to buy from Lim Siu Long. So Lim Xiong have a very powerful influence to the uh, cigarette factory. So I think the, he is the man. And secondly is a uh, textile industry. Maybe at least 50% of the textile industry are owned and run by the Fuching people. And only is a Fuching, and he has a very powerful influence in this uh, 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 
a Fuching Society, the second. And thirdly, Lim Xiu Liang, also the owner of the, the flower, flower mill. And the flower mill at that time also is a monopoly. And then <coughs> also Lim Xiu Liang has a smang factory. It is also at the time is a monopoly. So they have uh, five different connections. So I think he is the man can fulfill my dreams as a second clearing house. So I left Pen and Bank and I joined. I persuaded Mr. Lim to be my partner and run the business, uh, the, the, the Bank Central Asia. And finally, I spent 16 years and then to grow Bank Central Asia as the largest uh, private bank in Indonesia and then the fifth largest bank as a whole. And also, also is the second clearing house of Indonesia. So what was it like working with uh, Lim Xu Leong? I think he is the very wise man. During say, 16 years old, uh, 16 years time, working with him, I never heard, I never hear, he complain somebody else. Oh. Always talking good, any uh, anybody. This is a very unique uh, per person. But as a leader, what did you think of him? How did he manage you? I mean, did he allow you? Because you already had built up a reputation of uh, being the magic man of mm -hmm. banking, right? So did he just let you run BCA by yourself, or did yeah, he yeah. give you? He fully authorized power to me. That is a very, very special. Without his uh, trust on me, I don't think I have a. Uh, uh, ability to build up the Bank Central Asia as today. But you had some differences with Mr. Lim as well. I mean, um, you've said before that linking banking and politics is very dangerous. But uh, it's been well documented that Lim Xu Long had very close ties with Suharto. So how did you manage this difference? I just persuaded him to receive money from the government's uh, size, particular is the called uh, Yayasan, is a foundation, government foundation's uh, fund. I prefer to pull the money from the small, say, uh, people. So that's like a cent. So many cent is a huge. Uh, but they, they move uh, very steady. This is uh, my philosophy. So I like to have a business from uh, what they were, the people, the business at large, but not depend on very few people they have uh, money. That's including the, say, uh, the government fund management, something like that. Yeah. So keep distant to the government-run business, government-owned uh, entity. There were some difficult times when you were at BCA also. Uh, I read um, that you, your eldest son, Andrew, had incurred quite a large sum of losses from speculative trading, and you actually fired him because of that. Now, some people said it was a very harsh thing to do. Um, what was your thinking behind it? Did, why did you think it was necessary to do that? Uh, only one day, I went go to the my son's rooms, and I have fun. On his desk, they have a one computer. At that time, the computer is a uh, only for the. 
for the say, information of the fa uh, foreign exchange uh, rates. So I asked, uh, I was asking to his uh, secretary, is it Andrew watch very, uh, uh, very much or only uh, once a while? Yeah. He said, oh, from morning to, to, to evening, you always watch very careful. And then I have a feeling that he is uh, uh, say speculating in the foreign exchange. So this is uh, again my policy. I don't allow all the people in the bank doing the speculation. But Andrew, I found out he is doing the uh, what he calls uh, foreign exchange uh, <coughs> business. And I consider this is a speculation. And this is a, not the PCA business. Must be the, he's a private. So I go into the, his, uh, his uh, account and I find, find out he is doing that. And then I fire him out. And then Mr. Lim and his two sons, Andre Halim and say, uh, Anthony Salim, came to my house. He said, Mokhtar, why you file Andrew? Andrew is very capable. And I told him, no, he is capable, but I don't allow him to speculate in the in the foreign exchange. It is very dangerous. But they don't understand. He said, oh, this is small things. Not necessary to fight him out. But I insist, Andrew has to go out, not involved in the bank. So three, year, uh, three months later, one of the director of the bank, bank, bank Duta. This gentleman also playing the, uh, the foreign exchange. And then they lost about more than 300 million US dollar. And it went into a very big uh, problem. So after that, Mr. Lim appreciate that I have a uh, very, uh, very firm decision. But you decided to leave PCA in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, how was it like telling Park Lim, you know, your decision to leave? Actually, Mr. Lim, he insisted me not to leave. But I told him, because uh, we are old enough, and your children, my children also grew up, and let them doing business separately, not work together. And uh, finally, he do understand, and then he agree to separate. Um, what is your vision for Indonesia? In my uh, observations, after two thousand year, after year two thousand. So the, uh, the world economy center already moved from the uh, Atlantic Basin to the Pacific Basin. This is a big change. The economy center is here. United States, Japan, uh, Korea, and China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, so it's a very strong economy here. Uh, China, we play very important uh, uh, role in this area with the United States. So we are talking about the Pacific. So two giants, United States and China, these two. So for, for instance, United States 
spent about 50 years to build up 50,000 kilometers of uh, uh, highway. But China only spent 13 years to build 50,000 uh, kilometers of uh, highway. And even they only spent eight years times build up 16,000 kilometers of a high-speed railway. And also his this will up so many harbor and so many say uh, uh, airport and all the capital city of the uh, county we all build up a new city as always as good as Jakarta the county city they have a uh, so uh, good as a facility. That means the uh, increase a huge demand on the material. So Brazil, Venezuela, uh, Canada, Australia, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, and the other uh, Africa country. We are benefit uh, the, 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 the economic growth of China. But today, China already saturated. So everything, infrastructure slow down. So that means demand going down. So they affect the whole uh, country in the world, the whole economy in the world. I call it this uh, China Factors Century. This is the situation. So, under such a situation or circumstance, China, no way, no other way. The only way is to uh, move out their in the industry capacity to the neighboring com company. Uh, country. So one of the most potential buyer or candidate is Indonesia. Is Indonesia. The only way, the only place, the only country can uh, help China to overcome their overcapacity is Indonesia. So that means in the next 20 years, Indonesia will be the country, they will build up so many infrastructure and economy will growing up. That is my vision. So what kind of leader do you think Indonesia needs to bring it to that stage that you see in the next 20 years? I think sir, we are very fortunate that we have uh, uh, President Jokowi. Uh, they have a very uh, wise uh, visions because uh, he realized that Indonesia we need a lot of uh, say infrastructure and then because we are the island country we need a maritime uh, industry so this is a uh, two area that as, uh, as Jogowi uh, mentioned I think this is very wise, yeah. And then I feel so very com uh, confident that he will uh, done a good job, yeah. Okay. What do you think are the traits of a good leader? What qualities do you think a good leader must have? Doer. This is the most important thing. Just do it. <laughs> Don't talk too much. <laughs> okay, well, um, many people have described you as a visionary, you know, able to have foresight and see the future. Um, and this visionary is also one of the traits that your son James um, said in answer to the same question, what traits make a good leader? He said vision, humility, and ability to serve. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these three 
characteristics that he, he pointed out. I believe my second generation is better than me. So what he, what he said, I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you taught him well? Uh, I learned him from him. And Lipo has successfully transitioned from the first generation to the second. Um, do you have concerns about Lipo in the future? Or, you know, there's a Chinese saying that wealth doesn't last for more than three generations. Are you concerned about that? I can strongly advise, uh, uh, tell you, my third generation will carry on the business as even good as, uh, more than me. Why? Because my third generation are well educated and also they have very good uh, manner and very, work very hard, very smart. So I believe my third generation is much, much capable than me. They will run the business very good. Good. You mentioned education and you're spending uh, a lot of your philanthropy is in education. Mm. Why is that so important to you? Uh, because uh, my father always uh, mentioned one family is going to be, say, to be rich. It's a much depend on the family education. One company can grow up very well. It depends on the good people. They have a good education in our company. And one nation can be the good and strong nation is the depend on the education. So everything based is the edu education. So I think so, after succeeding in our business, so my social responsibility is to help our government to build up the education as well uh, in Indonesia. Uh, last question for you, sir. How do you want to be remembered? What do you want your legacy to be? Mm, this is a very, uh, very difficult question, yeah? <laughs> because I never think about this. But maybe the most important thing to me is uh, let my family, my children, my grandson, they can contribute in the education and the, in the healthcare. Thank you very much, sir, for speaking with us. We've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.